Welcome to UFO Buster Radio. Happy Father's Day. Cue the music. Welcome to UFO Buster Radio. My name is Manny Moonraker, and this is episode 92. Today is Father's Day, June 18, 2017. And I've been doing the Sunday episodes live, but we're not going to do that today because, of course, it is Father's Day. So what I decided to do was talk about the father of all fathers when it comes to ufology. And that is Dr. Joseph Allen Hynek. Born May 1st, 1910, uh, up until his passing, April 27, 1986, Dr. Hynek is referred to as the father of ufology. He was born in Chicago in 1910. He completed his Ph.D. in 1935. His specialization was the study of stellar evolution and in the identification of spectroscopic binaries. So if that doesn't tell you anything, in plain English, Dr. Hynek was an astronomer, also referred to as a professor, and lastly, what brings us here to UFO Bus Radio is the fact that he's also referred to as a ufologist. Anyone that's done any research in ufology, especially going back in the day, we'll see that his name is synonymous with certain research conducted by the United States Air Force under the project's names of uh, Project Sign, Project Grudge, and Project Blue Book. The truth is that many, by many accounts, Dr. Hynek's perspective when he first started with Project Sign in 1947 was that of a debunker. He was known not only for being skeptical, but for someone who didn't believe that UFOs had really had anything to do about anything. In fact, he was quoted many times stating that UFO reports were made by unreliable witnesses or people who had misidentified man-made or natural objects. In many words... He also said that these individuals were not credible people. In 1948, he was quoted as saying, The whole subject seems utterly ridiculous. And it was basically a a fad that would just go away, disappear forever. That was 1948. 2017, we're still talking about it. Early on, people really uh, looked at him as bending the rules of science in order to try to debunk UFO reports in every way possible. In a book in 1977, Dr. Hynek admitted that he enjoyed his role as a debunker for the Air Force, and even went as far as stating that the Air Force expected him to debunk these claims. However, working through these Air Force projects, it turns out that Dr. Hynek's opinion began to shift. A significant turning point was when, in the uh, 1950s, he conducted a poll among other astronomers. It's uh, critical to note that Dr. Hynek kind of saw people that were not educated as being unreliable and people that were not credible. This is the reason why his little poll of fellow astronomers changed his mind. A significant percentage of those astronomers polled reported seeing UFOs. So this was something he couldn't explain. He was saying that you and I, the blue-collar person, could not identify these things because we really had a lack of knowledge, a lack of perspective. But when his fellow people 
his educated astronomers gave him UFOs in their responses to his poll. He began to change his perception of things. In addition, because he conducted a poll, apparently he was impacted by the fact that many in the science community were very dismissive of what he was doing and were really arrogant, not only to his fellow astronomers, but to people who report UFOs in general. So his change in heart from being a debunker to really wanting to apply science with regard to UFOs came in 1953 when he wrote an article for the Journal of Optical Society of America titled Unusual Aerial Phenomena, and it contained the following quote. Ridicule is not part of the scientific method, and people should not be taught that it is. The steady flow of reports, often made in concert by reliable observers, raises questions of scientific obligation and responsibility. Is there any residue that is worthy of scientific attention? Or, if there isn't, does it not an obligation exist to say so to the public, not in words of open ridicule, but seriously, to keep faith with the trust the public places in science and scientists. Dr. Heineck then went on to create and head the Center for UFO Studies, which he founded in 1973, approximately 20 years from that statement. So in the effort to kind of place all of this into perspective, I have an audio clip of an interview that Dr. Heineck was part of and where he talked about UFOs. Ladies and gentlemen, the father of ufology. Is your job to assemble evidence that will prove it to be so or to assemble evidence to prove that it did not happen. You know, there are two ways to go on any investigation. The first thing we do is to try to disprove it. Mm -hmm. Because what is the point of establishing, or of, of perpetuating a myth or something that isn't so? And it turns out that some 90% of the raw reports, see, we have a, a nationwide police network, uh, an 800 number that the police use, and uh, we get reports every night from police departments or different parts of the country. Most of them are planets, twinkling stars... Explainable or identifiable things. The IFOs, we call them, identifiable flying objects. But that remaining 10%, those are the ones we go after. Now, a UFO, the U in UFO, of course, simply means unidentified. It does not necessarily mean visitors from outer space. But it must be unidentified not just to the person who is puzzled by it, but it must remain unidentified after considerable study. Then and only then is it a UFO. What are you investigating right now? What have been some things that have come up in the last couple of months that you're looking into? Well, we have a very interesting case uh, just uh, in, Mis in Muscatine, Iowa, just comes to mind. Uh, sometimes, you know, animals are the first things to give a uh, warning that some th something strange is oh, going on. Oh, any time. In California, for example, before an earthquake, the animal mm -hmm. kingdom is aware of it long before we are. They do, That's do true. things. That's true. We had a letter from a chap saying that uh, what first called my attention to something going on was the fuss that the horses were raising in the barn. But this time it's rabbits. There's a, it's a rather an interesting story. There is a chap that uh, runs a toll gate at Muscatine, Iowa, across the river there. And he runs the, from the 11 p.m. to 7 a.m. shifts. Mostly all night, too. Okay. Yeah. And about 3 o'clock in the morning, it has been his custom for quite a while to feed the, ra the wild rabbits. He takes ra uh, carrots and tosses them out, and the rabbits grab a carrot and dash off. At this time, at 10 minutes to 3, he goes out there and the rabbits are just lying flat and immobile on the cement. Just not, absolutely, not, not dead, okay. but just as though they were petrified, paralyzed. And simultaneously, as soon as he sees that, he hears a humming sound, a loud humming sound, and a large yellow object rises from across the river and comes across. And it, the whole thing lasted for some six minutes. As soon as it was gone, the rabbits jumped back to life and scurried off and also at the same time we're still investigating there was a concomitant power outage in Muscatine now we don't know whether that was had anything to do with the UFO mm -hmm. or not but it may have 
Usually there is some kind of a, a power fluctuation or power outage. So those are the sorts of things that, were, that we investigate. Mm -hmm. All right. and, but you have no, uh, the jury's still out on this one. The jury's one. still out on that one, yeah. What do you think the government knows about UFOs that they're not telling us? If you well, could you say see, in, a sense, in a sentence or two before I introduce uh, Mr. Gersten here. Yeah, you know, he, uh, that's, that's his baby. And uh, the point is that I was with Project Blue Book, of course, for a long while. <clears throat> in fact, it was as an astronomer that I got into this. I think it's always important to... For, for me, it's important to recognize that I am an astronomer and got into it because the Air Force needed an astronomer. And in fact, uh, I continue to be an astronomer. I'm, I'm going to have a, a monthly column in Science Digest on astronomy, not on UFOs. Now, the, in my association with Project Blue Book, I, don't, I know very well that it was not a scientific project. Also, I also know that they never, never would notify the media when an interesting case came up. They did everything they could to keep it, down, keep it, keep down. it down. So they definitely withheld information. I will not go so far as to say that it was a, you know, a Machiavellian sinister cover-up. Or, or conspiracy. Or conspiracy. Right. I don't like those terms. But, uh, but withholding of documents, yes. And that's exactly what Peter Gerson has been so good at. Getting and so diligent in uh, pursuing extreme, it through the Freedom of Information Act. Theory going around that anybody who saw a flying saucer was probably well, befuddled by swamp gas somewhere in Louisiana well, and didn't know what he or she was yeah, seeing. We've, we've had a lot of documentation since that time. I think that that one of the main things that uh, has come out here that Peter has done is to substantiate the credibility of many of the civilians because it was easy to, and still is, to discredit a civilian. Uh, much more difficult to discredit a military man. Uh, in Blue Book, for instance, we would get reports from military pilots, and that was particularly embarrassing to the Air Force because after they had trained those men, and they couldn't very well, they could say that a civilian pilot might have been un untrustworthy, but they could hardly say that to their, of their own military exactly. pilots, and we got case after case after case from military pilots, which never hit the press. Remember about 10 years ago, maybe even longer, there were reports of sightings in the daily press on an almost weekly basis. There'd be an account on page three or four of most major newspapers that somebody somewhere in this country had sighted a flying saucer. Oftentimes there'd be a photograph of the sky with an object or something. You don't see much of that in newspapers anymore. Are there no sightings, or is the press not reporting them? Do they consider it not to be newsworthy? That's, that's it. To a large extent, it's no longer news because the same sorts of things are being reported. See, if it was something new, the, the, this is the one. There are three things about this whole thing, Tom, that no one can deny. They're incontrovertible points. Even the grossest skeptic can't deny them. First of all, is that the UFO reports not only exist, but persist. See, when I started with the Air Force, I thought that this was a fad. In a few years, we just disappeared. It'd be all over, okay. And it's global. We have reports now from 140 countries. I mean, as many, practically as many countries as there are in the United Nations. And the most <coughs> important of the three things is that many, unfortunately not all, but many of the reports come from highly, highly credible, technically trained people, you see. So there you go. And, you know, it's, uh, it's fascinating that in the audio clip, uh, by the way, he was being interviewed. It's fascinating there because even, in, even at that point, you can hear that he's focused on the idea that you kind of have to be credible. And credible in this particular conversation is credibility for him was someone who was educated enough in the scientific method in order to really identify whether or not something is truly a UFO. And he said it himself. He doesn't, he doesn't like the stigma of the word saucer. He doesn't like the stigma of little green men. But really, if you chop down all the other possible sources for a UFO, what's left? I've linked the entire interview. It's a YouTube video. It lasts about 15 minutes. It also has Peter Gershon in it. Uh, back in the day, it was also filing Freedom of Information Act requests with the CIA and other government agencies trying to get information on UFO reports. Folks, this isn't new. When you hear something in the news today about Freedom of Information Act, it's not something new. We have been submitting this for a very long time, and we're getting nowhere. Someone recently said that the volume of evidence that we have 
unexplained, unknown objects in the sky or aerial phenomena is significant. So when people say, what evidence do you have? Many of us are just dumbfounded. It's like, are you serious? And what do you do? I mean, there's there's just nothing we can do because we are still today seen as individuals that are not credible on the subject matter. So all of you that have sightings, the people that say they've been abducted, they are not subject matter experts, so they cannot be credible individuals. What's funny is that Subject matter experts are usually the ones with the experience, not the people sitting in a lab or behind a desk making judgment calls. So there you go. That is the father of ufology. I figured this would be a great day to bring back an oldie but goodie. Last, before we end the episode, I want to congratulate Billy for winning the co-host contest. Billy... Send me an email to manny at ufobusterradio.com with your contact information so that we can get the book and acknowledge to you. Congratulations. I'm looking forward to your dissection of the text. With that said, this is episode 92. Manny Moorricker, I'm signing out. Gonna go enjoy Father's Day. Ciao.